My topic is the development of the concept of childhood. You're inclined to think that people thought the same about children during many centuries, but there are some clues who make us think that this is not the case. I'd like to present three sources which help us to understand better the development of the concept of childhood. My first source is uh, Barbara Tegman's study with the title The Distant Mirror, the Calamitous 14th Century. Uh, the procedure of the author is quite interesting. She, uh, she writes the biography of a Norman aristocrat called Ingeron de Cossy. Um, she didn't want to write the biography of a very well-known person because uh, there would have been too much literature about it. On the other hand, she cannot, as she would have liked, to write about an ordinary person, because about this person um, simply no archives would, uh, would still exist. This is what she writes about the youth and childhood of Engeron. Although doubtless precious to his parents as firstborn son, and heir of a great dynasty, the infant Engeron VII was probably not the adored object of the coddling and tenderness that babies are by nature supposed to inspire. Of all the characteristics in which the medieval age differs from the modern, none is so striking as the comparative absence of interest in children. Emotion in relation to them rarely appears in art or literature or documentary evidence. The Christ child is, of course, repeatedly pictured, usually in his mother's arms, but prior to the mid-14th century he is generally held stiffly, away from her body, by a mother who is sleuth even when nursing. Or else the holy infant lies alone on the ground, swaddled or sometimes quite naked and uncovered, while an unsmiling mother gazes at him abstractedly. Her separatedness from the child was meant to indicate his divinity. If the ordinary mother felt a warmer, more intimate emotion, it found small expression in medieval art because the attitudes of motherhood were preempted by the Virgin Mary. In literature, the chief role of children was to die, usually drowned, smothered or abandoned in forests on the orders of some king fearing prophecy or made husband testing a wife's endurance. Women appear rarely, rarely as mothers. They are flirts, bawds, and deceiving wives in the popular tales, saints and martyrs in the drama, unattainable objects of passionate and illicit love in the romances. Occasionally, motherhood may break through, as when an English preacher, to point a moral in a sermon, tells how a mother warms her child because of her love to him. An occasional illustration or carving in stone shows parents teaching a child to walk, a peasant mother combing or delousing her child's hair with his head in her lap, a more elegant mother of the 14th century knitting a, a child's garment on four needles, an acknowledgement from a saint's life of the beauty of infancy, and from the 12th century uh, Angren Rivel, a description of a passionate mother playing hide and seek with her child, and who, when he cries for her, leaps forth and lightly with outspread arms, and embraces and kisses him, and wipeth his eyes. These are isolated mentions, which leave the empty spaces between more noticeable. Medieval illustrations show people in every human activity, making love and dying, sleeping and eating, in bed and in the bath, praying, hunting, dancing, ploughing, in games and in combat, trading, travelling, reading and writing, yet so rarely with children as to raise the question, why not? Maternal love, like sex, is generally considered to innate, to be eradicable, but perhaps under certain unfavourable conditions it may atrophy. Owing to the high infant mortality, of the times, estimated at one or two in three, the investment of love in a young child may have been so unrewarding 
that by some rules of nature, as when overcrowded rodents in captivity will not breed, it was suppressed. Perhaps also the frequent childbearing put less value on the product. A child was born and died, and another took its place. Well off noble and bourgeois families bore more children than the poor because they married young and because, as a result of playing wet nurses, the period of infertility was short. They also raised more, often as many as six to ten reaching adulthood. Guillaume de Cousy, grandfather of Enguerrand, raised five sons and five daughters. His son Raoul raised four of each. Nine out of the twelve children of Edward III and Queen Philippa of England reached maturity. The average woman of twenty, it has been estimated, could expect about twelve years of childbearing, with live birth spaced out owing to stillbirth, abortions and nursing at fairly long intervals of about thirty months. At this rate, the average of birth per family was about five of whom half survived. Like everything else, childhood escapes a flat generalization. Love and lullabies and cradle rocking did exist. God in his grace wrote Philip of Navarre in the 13th century, gave children three gifts. To show joy and love to those who play with him, to inspire love and tenderness in those who rear him, of which the last is the most important, for without this, they will be so dirty and annoying in infancy and so nafty and capricious that it is hardly worth nurturing them through childhood. Philip advocated, however, a strict upbringing, for few children perish from excess of severity, but many from being permitted too much. Books of advice on child rearing were rare. There were books, that is, bound manuscripts, of etiquette, housewifery, deportment, home remedies, even phrase books of foreign vocabularies. A reader could find advice on washing hands and cleaning nails before a banquet, on eating fennel and anise in case of bad breath, on not spitting or picking teeth with a knife, not wiping hands on sleeves or nose or eyes on the tablecloth. A woman could learn how to make ink poison for rats, and sand for hourglasses. How to make hippocrass or spiced wine, the favorite medieval drink. Or how to care for pet birds in cages and get them to breed. How to obtain character references for servants and make sure they extinguish the bad candles with finger or breath, not with their shirts. How to grow peas and craft roses. How to rid the house of flies. How to remove grease stains with chicken feathers steeped in hot water how to keep a husband happy by ensuring him a smokeless fire in winter and a bed free of fleas in summer. A young married woman could be advised on fasting and almsgiving and saying prayers at the sound of the matin bells before going to sleep again and on walking with dignity and modesty in public, not in ribald wise with roving eyes and neck stretched forth like a stag in flight, looking this way and that like unto a runaway horse. She could find books on estate management for times when her husband was away at war, with advice on making budgets and withstanding sieges, and on tenor and feudal laws, so that her husband's right would not be invaded. But she would find few books for mothers with advice on breast feeding, swaddling, bathing, weaning, solid feeding, and other complexities of infant care. All of these might seem to have been of more moment for survival for the race than breeding birds in cages and, or even keeping husbands comfortable. When breast feeding was, men, uh, <coughs> was mentioned, it was generally advocated by one 13th century encyclopist, encyclopedist Bartholomew of England in his book On the Nature of Things for its emotional value. In the process, the mother loves her own child most tenderly, embraces and kisses it, nurses and cares for it most solicitously. A physician of the same period, Aldo Brandino of Siena, who practiced in France, advised frequent cleaning and changing, and two baths a day, weaning on porridge made of bread with honey and milk, ample playtime, 
and unforced teaching at school, with time for sleep and diversion. But how widely this human teaching was known or followed, it is impossible to say. On the whole, babies and young children appear to have been left to survive or die without great concern in the first five or six years. What psychological effects this may have had on character and possibly on history can only be conjectured. Possibly the relative emotional blankness of a medieval infancy may account for the casual attitude toward life and suffering of the medieval man. The next source that I want to present is a quite interesting text from the beginning of the 16th century. The text was written by a Swiss scholar named uh, Thomas Platte and it is quite exceptional. It is not a biography in a modern sense, but um, it was a letter left to his son who became um, an important uh, doctor, medical doctor in his time and who wrote a lot of uh, reports on his travels through Europe. Thomas Platter, the father, was born into a quite poor family in the Swiss Alps. In his description uh, he tells us the circumstances of his childhood. Um, this is what he writes about his childhood. Uh, my father died so early so that I cannot remember that I've ever known him, because, as it is the custom in the country, that all women spin wool in winter, producing uh, clothes for the people, the men go into the cities in order to buy wool. Uh, this is what my father did. He traveled to Thun, this is a, a village, in, a large village in Switzerland, to buy wool. There he became sick of the plague. He died there and he was buried in Strafisburg, another, another village. My mother married again soon after, a man who's called Heinzmann and who had a house between two villages in the area. Uh, all children were from my mother, but um, I don't remember how many children she had had. I have known two of my sisters. One um, had died in Entlebüch, another village, um, and died there. Her name had been Elspeth. Another, the name of another one was Christine. She died of the plague when she was nine years old. I also knew some brothers. The name of one was Simon, another one was called Hans and one Yoda. Simon and Hans died in wars. Yoda uh, died uh, in another village uh, because uh, he had been ruined. So that nearly all of my uh, brothers and sisters had to serve in other houses. <clears throat> if you follow the account we can find that uh, sickness early death are just uh, omnipresent phenomena in the life of the author. The author tells us another anecdote. When he was very young, living with the new husband of his mother, he had to work as a shepherd. That meant he had to go with the goats into the mountains and uh, watch them. One day, so he tells us, he fell into a hole and broke his leg. He was unable to get up again or to escape from the hole and he tells us that he stayed there for two days and nights and when there was no water left he prepared to die. Uh, at last his brothers found him. But a point that he makes clear is that the brothers, brothers were not so much worried about him but about the goats which were um, the means which allowed the family to live. The rest of his biography is quite exceptional. He moves into the city of Zurich 
where he learns the office of printer, a quite new one at that time. For this office he has to learn to read and write and he goes on studying just becoming after traveling as a beggar student through uh, different cities a scholar, quite famous and rich scholar in Zurich. But we have to understand that this biography is extremely exceptional because the destiny of most people in the Middle Ages, not only in Switzerland, were just uh, defined by the family in which they were born in. The last source that I want to present is Philippe Arias study Centuries of Childhood published in 1960. Arias is studying into the slow development of the modern concept of childhood. Therefore, he researches into many statements made in the 17th century, finding some quite interesting ones. Um, I'd like to quote some of these statements that appear in uh, Arias' book. In the 17th century, in a play, but there appears a woman who tries to console her neighbor, which, who is a mother of five, as uh, they are called scoundrels. She tells her, don't worry, because half of them, or maybe all of them, will have died before they cause you any headache. Uh, it's quite a strange solace. But at the time it must have been difficult to attach oneself to something which uh, possibly could be lost um, immediately. Um, <clears throat> the same feeling appears in some statements of Montaigne, the famous philosopher, who said in one occasion, um, I've lost two or three very young children with disgust, but without regret. So, <clears throat> he didn't even know how many children he had lost. We have also a sentence in the uh, Imaginary Invalid by Molière, where uh, a person says, well, the child uh, doesn't count. Um, on the other hand, um, there is also uh, reported a statement of uh, a Madame de Cotecon who uh, says when told that her uh, little daughter had died that uh, she's very sorry and says that they will never have again such a nice uh, daughter. The idea that children were a full human personality as we are inclined to think today, wasn't known at the time. Too many children died. Just in order to quote again Montaigne, he said, um, All my children die when they're very young. That means this indifference was a direct and inevitable consequence of the demography of this period of time.